welcome back to my channel. My name is Megan and today I'm doing the Love Dared Challenge. It is a 40 day marriage challenge devotional and it's by Stephen and Alex Kendrick. And I have several videos before this. If you missed any, please go back and watch it. And because today I am on day 28 and it is Love Make Sacrifices. And it says, lay down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. And that's 1 John 3, 16. Life can be hard, but what will you, we usually mean is that our life can be hard. We're the first to feel it when we're the ones being mistreated or inconvenienced. We're quick to soak when we're the ones who feel deprived or unappreciated. When a life is difficult for us, we notice. But, off, but too often the only way to notice that life is hard for our mate is when they start complaining about it. And I wrote, when I first read this, I thought of the verse in Proverbs 31. I was studying and it was saying a Proverbs 31 woman knows her household in and out. And I feel like she would, she knows what's wrong with her spouse before he even complains. Um, I'm, I love Proverbs 31. I love Proverbs 31, and so that that just came into my mind. So um, go read that and see if it, if you can see the connection to this. What we're saying. Then instead of genuinely caring or rushing in to help, we think that they just have a bad attitude. The pain and the pressure they're under don't register with us nearly the same way as our pain and pressure. When we want to complain, we expect everyone to understand and feel sorry for us. It, this doesn't happen when love is at work. Love doesn't have to be jarred away by your mate's obvious signs of distress. Before worries and troubles have begun to bury them, love has already gone into action mode. It sees the weight beginning to pile up and it steps in to help. That's because love invites you to be sensitive to your spouse. And I said that's a Proverbs 31 woman. Love makes sacrifices. It keeps you so turned to what your spouse needs that you often respond without being asked. And when, and when you don't notice ahead of time and must be told what's happening, love responds to the heart of the problem quickly and directly. Even when your mate's stress comes out in words of personal accusation, Love shows comparison rather than becoming, becoming defensive. Love can look beyond a complaint and see a hurting person with an unmet need crying out for help. Love will then give strategically to meet the, that need. Instead of sitting around upset that they're not treating you the way you think they should, let love pick you up out of your self-pity and turn your attention to, towards toward discovering and meeting the, their hidden needs. That's what Jesus said. He laid down his life for us to show us that we should lay down our lives for others. That's 1 John 3.16. He taught us that the evidence of love is found in seeing a need in others, then doing all we can to satisfy it. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. That's Matthew 25, 35 through 36. These are the types of needs you should be looking for in your wife or husband. And it gave me a list and it says, is he hungry? Needing you sexually even when you don't feel like it. And I said, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> um, I always thought when you're hungry, it meant food. But there's different ways of looking at everything, I guess. Is she thirsty? Craving the time and attention you seem to be able to give to everyone else. Does he feel like a stranger, insecure in his work, needing home to be his refuge and sanctuary? Is she naked, frightened, or ashamed, desperate for the warm covering of your loving affir affirmation? Um, is she feeling sick, physically tired, and needing you to help guard him from interruptions? Does she feel in prison, fearful and depressed, needing some safety and intervention. And I said, I never thought of those words in that way. It put a different spin on it. Sometimes when I read stuff, 
uh, I think of it as it's written and it's not, it can go either way. Um, love is willing to make sacrifices to see that the needs of your spouse are given your very best effort and focus. When your mate is overwhelmed and under the gun, love calls you to set aside what seems to be essential in your own life to help to rescue them, even if it's merely the gift of a listening ear. Often all they really need is to just talk their situation out. They need to see in you two attentive eyes that you truly care about what is this is costing them and you're serious about helping them seek answers. They need you to pray with them about what to do and then keep following up to see how it is going. And I said, David says this all the time. <laughs> um, the words, how are you doing and how can I help you, need to stay fresh on your lips. And I said I do try to do this. Um, and I feel like that I do a pretty good job with that. The solutions may be simple and easy for you to handle, or you may be complex and expensive, requiring time, energy, and effort. Either way, God will give you unique insights into the pressure your mate is under and unique abilities to step in and greatly reduce their level of stress. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. That's Galatians 6 2. Jesus willingly took our problems on himself. And he extends us daily grace to empower us to do it for others. When the New Testament believers began to walk to love, their lives together were marked by sharing and sacrifice. Their heartbeat was to worship the Lord and to serve his people. All those who had believed were together in all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Acts 2, 44 through 45. As Paul said to one of the churches a, la a, a later decade, I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. at 2 Corinthians 12, 15. Li lives that have been raised from death by Jesus, great sacrifice should be ready and willing to make a small daily sacrifices for those within our rage and in need of our love. Okay, today's dare was... What is one of the greatest needs in your spouse's life right now? Is there a need you could lift from their shoulders today by daring act of sacrifice on your part? Whether the need is big or small, purpose to do what you can to meet the need. And it says, how much of your mate's stress is caused by the lack of concern or initiative? When you, you express a desire to help, how did they receive it? Are there other needs you could meet? And I wrote, I hope not much, but probably some. When I asked David if he needs help, he usually says he's okay, but if he does need something, it's usually small. I, I usually always tell him to tell me to let me know if he needs anything. Other needs, things around the house are, oh, needs, other needs are doing things around the house or caring for the kids so he doesn't have to worry about it. I should probably give him more one-on-one -on -one time without the kids. I do get preoccupied with them. I try to be there when he needs an ear to talk to and a shoulder to lean on. And a guy named Marty said, I will go through another 40 days and another and another until I have this ingrained in my heart. And a Bible verse that goes all with this is, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Matthew eleven twenty eight. All right, that is all for today. Okay, now I'm on day twenty nine. It is love's motivation. It says, "Render service with a good attitude, as to the Lord and not to men." That's Ephesians Mommy. six seven. It doesn't take long to discover that your mate will not always motivate your love. Many times they will demotivate it. More often than you'd like, it will seem difficult to find the inspiration to demonstrate your love. They may not even receive it when you try to express it. it that's simply the nature of life, even in fairly healthy marriages. But although moods and emotions can create all kinds of moving motivational targets, 
One motivation is certain to stay in the place, same place all the time. If this, when God is your reason for loving, your ability to love is guaranteed. Because love comes from Him. Think of it like this. When you were a child, your parents most likely established rules for you to follow. Your bedtime was a certain hour. Your room had to be kept mostly clean. Your schoolwork needed to be finished before you could, pl you could play. If you were like most people, you bent these rules as often as you obeyed them. And if not for the incentive of force and consequences, you might have no not obeyed them much at all. But sometimes in childhood, you might have been taught an idea like this. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And that is Colossians 3.20. At some level, you begin to realize that you didn't merely have your parents to answer to anymore. This was no longer a battle of the wills between you and your mom or dad. This was now between you and God. As it turns out, however, the relationship between parents and children is not the only thing enhanced by letting God become your driving motivation. Consider the falling heirs were pleasing Him should be become our goal. Work. Do you work heartily or for the Lord rather than for men? And that's Colossians 3.23. And I said, in my, on my YouTube channel, for God, or is it for subs? Is my YouTube channel for God or for subs? And I do pray about it and say that and if God blesses it, I hope he blesses it. So, I do pray about it. Um, service. And is obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who are merely pleased men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And that's Colossians 3.22. Everything. <laughs> Work hard at whatever you do, knowing that from the Lord you will see the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. That's Colossians 3, 23-24. And I said, being a mom, wa wife, in this YouTube channel is what I work hard at what I do. Even marriage. Wives, be so dear to your husband that it is fitting in the Lord. And that is Colossians 3, 18. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave him some up for her. And that's Ephesians 5, 25. This means the love you demonstrate in marriage should actually have one choice objective, loving and honoring the Lord with devotion and sincerity. Your role as a husband or wife will take a new focus on and drive when you see it in the instrument for living out your love for God. When pleasing Him becomes the why behind what you do. I said I needed to remember this when I need to do something and I don't want to do it. And this next part I really love. Um, I underlined it. So I'll say it twice. But it is God's word says we can love him through the ways we treat, serve, and love other people. That's 1 John 3, 17, 4, 11 through 21. So every loving thought, attitude, or action in your marriage can become another way for you to say, I love you, to God. The fact that it blesses your spouse as a process is simply a wonderful and additional benefit. So I'm going to say it again. God's love says we love God, love Him through the ways we treat, serve, and love other people. That's 1 John 3, 17, 4, 11 through 21. So every loving thought, attitude, or action in your marriage can become another way for you to say, I love you to God. In fact, that is a blessing your spouse in the process is simply a wonderful additional benefit. You may think your marriage or love for your spouse will suffer from making God your primary focus and your greatest delight, but quite the contrary. All of it will flourish as you draw closer to the one who created marriage and who loves your wife or husband in, in infinitely more than you do. This focus of this change of focus and perspectives is very strategic and crucial for a Christian. Being able to wake up knowing that God is your source and supply, not only of your own needs, but also those of your spouse, changes your whole reason for interacting graciously toward your mate. 
No longer is it this imperfect person deciding how much love you'll show them, but rather your omniperfect God is using even a flawed person like yourself to bestow loving favor on another. Has your wife become fairly hard to live with lately? Is her slowness at getting over a disagreement wearing on your patience? Then don't withhold your love just because she thinks indifferently from you. Love her as the as to the Lord. Is your husband turning you out, not saying much, brooding over something he's not interested in sharing? Are you tired of him being so inconsiderate of you, not even responding? Not even responding to the children the way he needs to? Then don't battle back with silence and inattention. Love him anyway as the as the Lord. As to the Lord, sorry. Love motivated by raw duty cannot hold out for very long. And love only motivated by ideal conditions can never be assured of sufficient oxygen to keeping it breathing. But love that is lifted up on offering to God never loses its anchor and is able to sustain itself when all other weather conditions have lost their ability to energize us. Those who are fine with mediocre marriages can leave their love to chance and hope for the best. But if you are committed to giving your spouse the best love you possibly can, and shoot for love unchanging, unchanging motivation. Love that keeps God as its primary focus is unlimited in the heights it can attain. When you're not motivated to do it for them, do it for Him. And I'm going to say that again because I really like it. Love the Lord God as its primary focus is unlimited in the heights it can attain. When you're not motivated to do it for them, do it for Him. Okay, today's there. Before you see your spouse again today, pray for them by the name and for their needs. Whether it comes from our, from you or not, say, I love you. Then express love to them in some tangible way. Go to God in prayer again, thanking Him for giving you the privilege of loving this one special person unconditionally the way He loves both of you. Then goes on to say, How will this change of motivation affect your relationship and reactions? What does this inspire you to do? What does it inspire you to stop doing? And I said, this change of motivation will affect our relationship in a positive way. It inspires me to show David love because I never, <clears throat> because I never stop loving David, even when I'm not motivated to do so. It will inspire me to stop looking at the things I've asked him to do over and over and get annoyed by. But, but be thankful I have him and love him the way he should be loved, the way God loves both of us. Okay, that's it for today. Okay, now I am on day 30, and it is Love Brings Unity. And it says, Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. And that's John 17, 11. One of the most impressive things about the Bible is the way it is beautifully linked together with consistent themes running through it 66 books, working in harmony to share God's redemptive plan for beginning to end. Though it interweaves his re revelations to 40 different authors over a span of 1,600 years, each with various backgrounds and the skill levels, God sovereignly inspired His Word with one Hi. united voice. Hi, Molly. Hi, baby. And He continues to powerfully speak through it today with perfect reverence without ever changing His message. Unity, togetherness, oneness, these are the unshakable hallmarks of our God. From the very beginning of time, we see his unity at work through the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father is there, creating the heavens and the earth. The Spirit is there as well, moving over the surface of the waters, Genesis 1, 2. And the Son, the radiance of his glory, and the exact representation of his na nature, Hebrews 1, 3, joins in speaking all the world's existence. Let us make man in our image according to his likeliness. Genesis 1.26 Us are 
All three, always in perfect oneness of mind and purpose. Centuries later, we see Jesus having come to earth as a man, rising from the waters of baptism as the Spirit descends upon him like a dove, and the Father announces over his majestic scene, This my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3, 17. Father, Son, and Spirit are in pristine unity. They serve each other, love each other, and honor each other. The Hi. perfect and unsurpassed high baby. They rejoice when the other is praised. Though distinct, they are one. Mm, that's indivisible. One. Okay, indivisible. And because the relationship is so special, it's so representative so special. of the vastness it's and grandeur of God, God, He has chosen. But okay, <laughs> baby, you don't have to repeat everything I, I say. Sorry. Are you going to be a preacher when you grow up? Yeah. Okay. Where was I? He has chosen to let us experience one aspect of it very personally. In the unique relationship of husband and wife, two distinct individuals are spiritually united into one flesh. Genesis 2.24 And what God has joined together, let man not separate. Mark 10.9 In fact... This mystery is so compelling, and the love between husband and wife is so intertwined and complete. God designed the imagery of marriage to reflect and explain his love for the church. The church, the bride, is the most satisfied when the Savior is worshipped and celebrated. Christ, the bridegroom, who has given himself up for her, is pleased and honored when he sees her as a radiant church, without a stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Ephesians 5, 27. While Christ and the church love and honor the other. That's the beauty of unity. It always strengthens relationships and homes, while the vision always destroys them. What would happen in your marriage, hus husband, if you devoted yourself to loving, honoring, and serving your wife in all things? What if you determined that the preservation of your oneness with this woman was worth every sacrifice and expression of love you could make? What if you wisely navigated through the conversations and misunderstandings in such a way to guard the unity between you? What would happen, wife, if you made it your mission to do everything possible to promote the togetherness of the heart with your husband? What if every threat of your unity was treated as a poison, a cancer, an enemy to be eliminated by the medicines of love, humility, respect, and selfishness? What would your marriage become if you never again really willing to see your oneness torn apart? What if we took these words of the Apostle Paul to heart? Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there will be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1, 10. Oneness in marriage requires keeping each other on the same page. It means communication must become constant so the unit can be constantly enjoyed. It means sharing your thoughts, values, decisions, and upcoming plans, interweaving your lives together so that you attain one heart, decide one accord, and speak with one voice. And whenever anything or anyone disrupts your unity, you both quickly do whatever it takes to resolve it and restore it. No. No. To agree again. The unity of the Trinity as seen from beyond the reaches of history past and continue on to the future gives endurance into the power of oneness. It is unbreakable. It is unending. It is wonderful. And it is this same spiritual reality that disguises itself each day at your home and mailing address. Though painted in the colors of work schedules and doctor visits and trips to the grocery store, oneness is an internal thread that runs through the daily experience of what we call our marriage and gives it a purpose to be defended for life. Therefore, love this one who is as much part as your body as you are. Serve this one who needs cannot be separated from your own. 
Honor this one who, when raised upon the pedestal of love, raises you both up as a clear reflection of God all at the same time. All right, today's there was isolate one area of your division in your marriage and pray about it. Ask the Lord to reveal anything in your own heart that is threatening oneness in your marriage. Pray that he would open up the communication line so that you can find more agreement and stay on the same page. And, in appropriate, and if appropriate, discuss this matter only seeking God for unity. Openly seeking God for unity. Did the Lord open your eyes to anything new that might be giving fuel to this point of disagreement? How do you intend to respond? What do you hope to see God do in your spouse? as well um i wrote what i wrote was personal so i'm not going to this will be the first time i don't actually uh, i believe it's the first time that i will actually be sharing with you what i wrote but it's personal between me and david and god of course so <laughs> but i will um go in and say uh, there's a bible verse that goes along with this and it says the lord is our god the Lord is one. That's Deuteronomy 6, 4. And also a lady named Lisa that did um, this said, I want my children to know how great marriage can be when God is in the center of it. All right. So that's the end of this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss any of our videos. And you can go back and watch the other Love Dare videos and then keep your eye out because I will be posting some more. Alright, until next time. Thanks. Bye.